Hello everybody, my name is Serena Chapman and today I have Nikki Newman with me and we will actually be discussing two fantastic pieces of work. Why don't you take it away, Nikki? Alrighty. So today we are introducing two cutting-edge masterpieces of the artistic world. The first is known as Autumn Rhythm, otherwise titled Number 30, by the talented and rebellious artist Jackson Pollock. The second work is from the artistic genius of Mark Rothko, titled Black on a Maroon, from a series of thought-provoking paintings he did when he was supposed to give them to his commissioner and later gifted them to the Tate Modern Museum. Let's first dis discuss Jackson Pollock. He had a very colorful background and even spent some time while he was young traveling by freight train around Oklahoma and northern Texas, where he met vagrants, prostitutes, and even did a few short stints in jail. Actually, I was reading up on him, and an online biography mentioned that he was quite the rebel during high school. He wore long hair, unconventional clothing, as was actually expelled several times for clashing with authorities. Go figure. <laughs> actually, <laughs> in a letter to his older brother... Pollock wrote, This so-called happy part of one's life, youth, to me, is a bit of damnable hell. Kind of an interesting view, I thought. Yeah. Well, as we look at his painting, Autumn Rhythm, it is striking in the sense that he was the first to explore what is now called action painting. Pollock's style wasn't meant to fit in. As you can see, his earlier teenage years really influenced and drove his rebellious nature that carried over into his many masterpieces. Well, Nikki, actually, when you look at his work, you can really see it. Even the way he painted was unconventional and very creative. It was recorded and photographed, actually, quite a few times. He would drip the paint right out of the cans, and he used hardened brush and sticks and other tools to splatter the paint while laying the canvas on the ground and just walking around it. Actually, I believe you have some work to show us, too. Actually, it seems kind of Pollock-inspired. You want to tell me about it? Sure. Well, I do have some work that was Pollock-inspired. You see, okay, I painted my room, splatter paint. I thought it would be a great idea to do it. I was like, love colors, love painting. Be perfect idea to like splatter paint my room, so I did that. So let's show a work of that piece. Okay, we'll pull it up right away. Okay, here it is. I actually like it a lot. I can see the Pollock inspiration. Mm. Must have been fun to paint too. Oh yes, it was on the ground. You see, because it's kind of hard to put the wall on the ground. But <laughs> other than that, <laughs> yeah, it is pretty Pollock inspired. But yes, <clears throat> I believe you have some pretty colorful shoes on today as well that I'm looking oh, at. Yes, those two. <laughs> <laughs> Let's show a quick picture of those. And actually, now we're gonna keep moving forward, and we're gonna talk. Actually, you were gonna say something about the way his inspiration worked. Yes, well, he didn't like his work to have his work represent anything. He said, if it creeps in, I try to do away with it, to let the painting come through. He was more focused on letting people come up with their own interpretation of his work. Mm -mm. Oh, that's pretty cool. When you first see Autumn Rhythm, it may come off as violent and paint splashed around vigorously. When you're looking at it, you can't miss the multitude of separate gestures that shape this painting. There are so many layers of paint thrown or dripped on the canvas, he performed kind of a flowing dance around the canvas, making sure he painted all the areas just right. You can definitely see the connection between the name Autumn Rhythm and the painting. You know. You can almost see the seasonal winds and the falling brown leaves and the whirling rhythms of the season suspended between growth and decay. I think that's pretty cool that you can see all that, and I definitely see it as a different interpretation for everyone. Yes, it is a lively piece that seems to explore how nature is disordered and shows the chaos of it. But what I find most moving about this picture is its instability. The way in which it switches back and forth between one thing and another as the viewer moves closer or farther away from it. You know, although it is just a painting, and just paint thrown on a canvas, it still can paint a picture. 
And the neat thing about it is it's a picture that everyone can see differently. Yes, and he didn't exactly paint from nature. He painted more the essence of nature. When asked by another painter why he did not work more closely from nature, he shot back the memorable, memorable response, I am nature. <laughs> wow. Crazy. He has some wit. Well, like Pollock, Rothko was also the one who experimented with going away from the norms of painting. Rothko found a new way of painting. He explored the idea of color and feel. He said, I'm only interested in expressing basic human emotions. Tragedy, ecstasy, doom, and so on. Also, what I found interesting was a quote that he believed in, that art came from an inborn feeling for form, the idea that lies in spontaneity, simplicity, and actually the directness of children. <laughs> Rothko was commissioned to produce a set of murals for the Four Seasons restaurants in the new Seagram building, which included the painting Black on Maroon, which we are looking at currently. In Rothko's words, this was a place where the richest bastards in the Oracle come to feed and show off. And if that wasn't all, his reasons were for accepting this commission were just as shocking. And this is one of my favorite quotes from him. I accept this assignment as a challenge with strictly malicious intentions. I hope to paint something that will ruin the appetite of every son of bitch who ever eats in that room. That's quite the statement he is making. Quite. <laughs> At this point, Rothko had been struggling with the art world of New York for more than 30 years. He described it as butting his head against a brick wall. He wanted his viewers to feel that they are trapped in a room where all the doors and windows are bricked up so that all they can do is butt their heads forever against the wall. Actually, Black on Maroon was part of a result of that commission, as we talked about earlier. Can't you really feel the depth and agony and the colors and the paint? The paint really comes and gives you a sense of depth when you stare into the black columns. They just are kind of there looming ominously in the middle. It kind of gives a sense of open graves waiting, to me at least. Almost if it is a portal to a dark and dreary world, a path you want to leave untreaded. He really gets his point across with what he is trying to do for the commission. Actually, I believe... When Rothko had finished the series of paintings, he declared, They are not pictures. I have made a place. And in the end, Black on Maroon didn't actually make it to the Seagram building, but Nikki instead is actually installed in the Tate Museum as a gift from Rothko himself. And recently in the news, on October 7, 2012, um, a Russian artist who claims to have defaced a Mark Rothko mural in the Tate Modern Gallery says, he has engaged in a piece of art and improved the value of the multi-million pound work. And here I'll show you a picture right now of that. And he seems to have painted what appears to be read as a potential piece of yellowism. And according to Online Manifesto, yellowism is an artistic movement run by two people named Vladimir and Marcin. Quite interesting, but that also gave the painting some more popularity in these days, brought new life to it, and made us look more at his work. So, I believe that's all we have for today. It's all, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki and Serena, over and out.